Welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast with Jacob Ayers, providing actionable content to help you along your journey to financial freedom through real estate investing. As the premier asset class, real estate has helped ordinary people just like you amass fortunes. The benefits of passive income from real estate investing will allow you to live a life you want. And now your host, entrepreneur, real estate investor, and apartment deal syndicator, Jacob Ayers. Hi, and welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast. Hi, I'm your host, Jacob Ayers. Welcome back to another episode. I'm so glad you're here. Today, I'm excited to bring on our guest, Gabe De Silva. Gabe is a Wall Street finance professional turned real estate investor and one of the most prolific home flippers in the entire country. Now, Gabe is not your traditional home flipper in the sense of doing one project and moving on to the next, but rather Gabe has built what he calls a vertically integrated business. Today, we dive into so many great things around mindset, building businesses and cultures, scaling and growing your real estate portfolio, and goal setting and crushing those goals. Gabe has some awesome insight that he shares in this episode. So I'm excited to introduce Gabe, bring him on the show. So let's jump right into it. All right, today I welcome on the show, Mr. Gabe De Silva. Gabe, hey, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on, brother. I'm excited. Hey, I've been following you for quite some time. There for a while, you were really active on Bigger Pockets. YouTube had some just awesome content you're putting out. You do some really, really unique stuff, some like catchy stuff. So, I mean, I could watch your YouTube videos for hours. You were doing some really cool stuff. So first off, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? How'd you get involved in what you're doing? Tell us a little bit about your journey and what you do. Sure. Yeah. So I like to say we're real estate investors, developers, and educators. So that's the quick one-liner. We do do a whole host of things. I say we're a vertically integrated real estate investment company. So that's us doing everything from finding funding, fixing and flipping deals to wholesale division, a retail division, starting now to portfolio properties, a supply company that we use to feed ourselves in our flips, as well as other local investors, developers, designers, and the education arm. We're out here hosting events, taking folks out to our projects, showing them how we do what we do, master classes where we really dig into the systems, and newest yet, a, a mastermind. So we wear a lot of hats, we do a lot of things, but I like to say we're a vertically integrated real estate investment company, and we operate in and around Union County, New Jersey. That's our farm. But some of the stuff that we are doing is taking us, the education stuff in particular, it's kind of taking us out of state. That's the gist. That's the high level stuff. Awesome. So you've got a lot of free time on your hands. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, how'd you get started investing in real estate, Gabe? What was your entry to it? My background's in finance. So I've got three finance degrees and I did everything from corporate finance to financial services. Eventually after being let go two times over the course of 18 months, by no fault of my own, just the market dictated it was time for me to go. I realized that I needed to be the master of my own destiny and started looking into entrepreneurship, started studying, reading Michael Gerber and Think and Grow Rich and things along those lines. And yeah. uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, a lot of the books that most of the listeners have probably heard of. And that my mindset shift started to take place. And it happened over the course of a few months. And I would say I was about 28 at the time. And I came to this realization that I need to, like I said, master of my own destiny. And my first foray into entrepreneurship was the food space, a buddy who had a similar journey, uh, found himself let go as well. And we were both like, well, let's go open a restaurant. And we thought that was a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> so we jumped in no prior experience. We did that. We ran that uh, successfully, surprisingly, for two guys with no food experience. I ultimately sold to him. And then I went on to start real estate investing. I happen to have a background in construction. My family was in the construction business. So uh, for whatever reason, that's not where I thought to go at first. But it's one of those things like where subconsciously it's ingrained in you as a child growing up in and around construction sites and dad reading blueprints at the dinner table, things like that. It found its way back into my life and started with one simple uh, fix and flip and five years ago. And here we are today running at any given time, as many as eight, eight to 10 projects, the wholesale division, everything that we were just talking about, education, hosting events, and a supply company. So yeah, like I said, a vertically integrated real estate company coming from a finance uh, background, essentially. 
Yeah, sure. Tell us about that first deal. You went out, started a uh, restaurant with another friend, and then you decided, hey, I'm going to get into real estate, which was kind of a natural progression given your background in construction. You're obviously a finance guy, good with the numbers. So you decide house flipping is going to be it. How'd you settle on house flipping? Why not buy and hold single families, duplexes, apartment syndication, any of the other number of things you could have done? Why mm -hmm. house flipping? Because of the background, because of the construction background and growing up in and around job sites and things like that. It's like I, I had the lexicon already. I started attending networking events, which is what essentially everybody does when they get started, right? To find out where they fit in the real estate investment space. You're at events. And, and I was going to two and three networking events a night for weeks and weeks on end. Wow. Networking <laughs> events a week, a week, I should say. Yeah, okay. For weeks on end, right? And just meeting a bunch of people and people are doing different things and they're in different niches. But that's what spoke to me just because I felt like once we started talking construction and blueprints and I was able to follow along, I was able to like entrench myself in those conversations a lot quicker. So it was almost by default that I found myself there and in that space with those guys. And then a deal found me by, uh, by virtue of an event like that, just out there shaking hands and telling people who you are and what you're up to. Someone presented an opportunity and uh, we went for it. Did our first fix and flip. It was meant to be something very much cosmetic and it turned into something very much not. And so again, uh, I learned a lot through the process. I think we did something like an 80K net on that deal and um, we were off to the races. Awesome. So first deal went well. Five years later, you're still doing it, crushing it, doing a large number of transactions every year. So tell us how you've scaled and grown your business and how you've just been able to have continued success over these past five years through some different times in the market even. So I kind of look at it like there were three different phases throughout these three years where things shifted for us. And it was at first, it was understanding leverage and we would do a deal, finish it, start another, finish it, start another. And I quickly realized that's no way to scale. You're not going to grow a business that way. You essentially just bought yourself a job flipping homes. So we started networking with lenders, hard money lenders in particular, because they're the only ones out there looking to lend to a guy with a short track record. And by virtue of those relationships from those networking events, found a really good lending partner, was able to then start doing two and three deals at a time with the monies that we had made, plus some other people's monies, right? Some private investors who saw what we were up to and wanted to get involved. That was one thing that really created a shift for us. Stepping into bigger projects was a second thing, I would say. Somewhere in between when I started and right now, we found, or maybe closer to the beginning, within the second to third year, we found a project that scared the shit out of me. So we went after it. And <laughs> that's where growth is, right? On the other side of fear is, is real growth. And we had done a bunch of cosmetic rehabs, but the opportunity presented itself to do something at a level, right? Something more construction heavy, more labor intensive, more capital intensive. And so with that construction background, I felt confident we'd be able to figure it out. And we went for it. The spread was amazing, right? So that created that bump. Like now I know we can handle bigger projects. Behind that came some new construction projects. And then I'd say like that third shift that got us to where we find ourselves now, and this is again, systems and scale kind of stuff was team. And so at my peak, I might've been doing six alone, managing six projects by myself, but there was no semblance of a system there. I was running to Home Depot five times a day. I was doing everything from the car, my cell phone, running late on every invoice. Just, it was an utter mayhem. So I started building a team and bringing on people, delegate and elevate that concept, assign the tasks to someone who's far better at them than you are. And by virtue of just being in a space, being in an office all day, like administrative tasks get done so much more efficiently. I found that that was the biggest thing. That's the first thing. Get those off the books, get those off your plate and watch yourself grow. Like watch your business really, really take off. Yeah, yeah. I was curious how the progression of how you kind of essentially built this into a business, because like you said earlier, it's easy to just buy yourself another job, right? Do a flip go on to the next one. And that many people kind of get started investing in real estate and some of these more common avenues like wholesaling or house flipping or whatever that might be. And those are really just transactional jobs. You go out, find a deal, sell it, go out, find another deal, sell it, go out, find a deal, flip it, you know, that kind of thing. So it's a big difference between doing that and doing what you're doing, which is essentially have created a business around this, this asset class, right? Yeah, we think about it the, very much the same way. It's the difference between active and passive. And so we didn't want to be active real estate investors forever. It's served us and it'll serve most guys as they get started if, if they choose to go that route out of the gate. But if you stay that path, you'll only ever be an operator. You'll be a technician. The way Michael Gerber creates that distinction between technician, operator, and owner. And we, we don't want to be operators. We don't want to be swinging hammers. We want to oversee the swingers of the hammers. And in my case, as we scale to the point where you're doing this many deals, your operations division, someone oversees like the swinger of the hammers and you oversee them. We took that approach to essentially everything. As soon as I realized what like leverage, how leverage worked when it came to financing, and I don't like to call people assets or leverage, like my people, my team are not that. <laughs> yeah. but leveraging people's skill sets 
that's a different thing. And when you find someone who's better at something than you are, you delegate that responsibility to them, give them the tools and resources that they need to be successful in that seat, let them do that. And now you go on to doing the one thing that I believe that, that I do really, really well, better than most anybody else is find and fund deals. So that's what I'm out there doing aggressively buying, taking down deals. Yeah. And I'm not so naive as to think that I'm the best in the world at that. I believe I'm the best in the world at something different, but that's not it. So the next step for us, the next logical progression for us is an acquisitions team. And so right now, the lead flow is such that it warrants it. And that's where we're at right now. So again, scaling that even. Yeah, I know you're a big systems processes guy and you have to be to, you know, grow the business that you have. So you're kind of touching on some of those things, building teams and leveraging skill sets and things. But talk a little bit about some of the systems and processes you've used in your business to be able to do the volume of deals you're doing now. That's the one thing we do really, really well, better than most anyone else is systems and processes. Okay, that's your superpower. A hundred percent. It's the way I'm wired. It, I've really worked on that skill to get it where it is today, where when I look at things, when I look at a process that's broken, even in my own business, because as you start and you launch, you do what you need to do to get things done. But if you're not looking in on that process at the beginning daily, then weekly, then monthly, and even quarterly and revisiting these processes, things can get away from you real fast. So I like to say, and, and we joke around here about like systems are just fancy words for lists. System is <laughs> essentially just a list. And so that's how it starts. What are we doing? Okay, well, and I would say I honed this craft in the restaurant space because without checklists, without systems in the restaurant space, you'll be eaten alive. And restaurants are not forgiving. Obviously, there's no shelf life for food. If your staff's there working Monday through Friday, they're expecting to be paid. You don't have these, I'll defer payment on my materials for 30, 60 days kind of thing like you do in <laughs> our space. Lumber doesn't sit on a shelf. Lumber can sit on a shelf for months, right? Yeah. Well, that wasn't the case there. So in the food space, I just started by simply writing down what we did each morning when we would open the store. What do we do every day? And what order we do? do we do it in? You do that for five days. At the end of the five days, you merge the five lists. you got a system. You've got the starting of a system. And then you look at the things that you did just one or two of those days, not all five. Well, that doesn't go on your manager's opening check checklist that goes on your weekly maintenance checklist or whatever you call them. You make up names. We're, we're also very good at that here. We love to make up <laughs> names for stuff. I work in corporate America still. We are the best at making up acronyms and names for things. So yeah, mm -hmm. I get it. <laughs> it helps us wrap our heads around what it is that we're doing. Even if we give it a name, we change the name a little later on. It doesn't much matter. But the purpose is to help us mentally and visually just like wrap our heads around the process and what it is that we need to do and what order we need to do it in. I also like to say, do everything once so that you can at least know how long it should take and how much it should cost. And that's another approach that we take to everything. So we're watching. And that's how in the fix and flip space with the trades, with the like really construction heavy stuff at first, I was over the guy's shoulder every day, every other day, popping in, watching him do what he was doing and trying to understand and ask a lot of questions. And so I never wanted to know. And to be frank, I probably know far too much about certain elements of the construction process. It's not necessarily that you know as much as like even my project manager at this point knows how to do mechanical drawings for HVAC systems. That's not necessary. Like we're hiring a tech for that. But we should at least know, is he taking advantage of us or not? Like it, should it take two weeks or should it take two days? So anyway, I guess that that's a really long winded way of, of saying like you dig in, you dig in only for as long as you need to document, make a list essentially. And those lists in turn become the systems that you work from and you tweak them, revisit them constantly first and then less and less. Uh, our chart of accounts, for example, for our fix and flip projects, we're not looking to revisit that more than once a year because well, for one, we wouldn't be able to do apples to apples comparisons on our expenses on projects. But I think we did a really good job of nailing that one within the first year or so. On the flip side of that, I, I mean, let me think of one we, we got working right now, oh, our um, acquisitions process, right? So okay, that's yeah. very much new. And we're in there essentially every day looking at how the data is coming through the, the flow, who's calling who, where in the process, what leads are being converted, which aren't, how are things working with appointment setting? Do we need a tool for that? And so we're developing a process in turn systems for each piece of that process. So it's very much fluid at the beginning and then should be very much rigid and regimented at the end. I like how you call these systems really just list, right? These aren't some fancy like expensive software packages or over the top like programs or something like that. These are just like, hey, we're going to do this and then this and then this. Once we realize those things work, yeah, that's what we'll do. But we might tweak this quote unquote system or this checklist or whatever you want to call it. So this is kind of a simplistic approach. I mean, you're not like recreating the wheel here, right? You're just kind of getting some processes down, some checklists, whatever you're going to call them. We've demoed things like Builder Trend and Co-Construct and those softwares that can be anywhere from, I don't know, 100 or two a month to 1,000 or 12 a month. Who even knows? I forget now. But you go in there 
there and it's based on housing starts. I mean, that alone should tell you something. It's based on housing starts. Like in the business that we're in, we're not a regional home builder. I'm not putting up a tract of 40 homes. I'm in New Jersey. So by virtue of where I am, that's practically impossible. So there's, not, <laughs> there's not enough land for that here. But yeah. there are guys that are doing that in other parts of the country and that tool serves them. But I look in that tool and I'm like, there's way too much crap in here we don't need. And so you wind up becoming a manager of the management of the project and less a project manager, if that makes sense. It, it becomes more about the system and sitting in the tool and submitting things for the sake of submitting them so you could tick off boxes than it does actually managing a project effectively and efficiently in the field. Yeah, sure. So when you're building these systems and processes, you're essentially trying to get your business to go to some place, whether that's scaling to you know a certain volume of deals per year or whatever it might be. So what does that look like for you? What are your goals? What are you trying to achieve when you're building these systems? systems and processes and implementing these new divisions in your company and all of that. So the way I look at it is I come to work every day looking for a way to fire myself. I want ah, to I like fire that. myself. So what am I doing today that I need not be doing that there's a system or a process that I can implement to do it for me? And that's my mindset around it. So they also say like an entrepreneur wakes up unemployed every day, right? Like we're broke. Every morning you wake up broke. You have to wake up with that mindset where you need to go and generate revenue for yourself because nobody's cutting you a check every two weeks. So I kind of wake up with that mindset, but also thinking as an entrepreneur, but as a, as a leader of a team and a genuine like business builder, how do I fire myself from acquisitions right now, for example? Like I said before, I'm not naive enough to think I'm the best in the world at that. In fact, I know that there are people that are infinitely better than me on the phone. I'm guilty of saying too much right out of the gate. Like all those things that they tell you not to do, amplify yeah. the pain. Like, I don't know how to do that. I'm frankly not very good at that. I'll come in and I'll say, hey, here's who I am. Here's what I'm about. How can we help you out of whatever situation you're in? That's my tact. But an acquisitions guy with the right training will go in there and he'll amplify the pain, all those different things that they say you should do to convert. So anyway, that's where I find myself now saying, all right, well, I need to fire myself as acquisitions. We need to find someone to come in and do that better than me, provide them with the tools, resources, training, education that they need and uh, delegate that responsibility and move on to the next thing as a business builder, like a visionary capacity, I need to be looking at, well, how do I find us more leads? How do I get us better quality leads? How do I keep feeding, filling the pipeline so the rest of the team can do what they do day in and day out? I like how you're super clear on where you can provide value in your business. And then you're pretty critical on yourself where you're like, hey, this is just not my forte. This is not where I should be specializing in or where I should be spending my time. Let's delegate that to somebody else. And I think that takes a lot of effort to realize like, hey, you know, I can't do it all. I can, but I can't do it the best. Or even if I can do it better than someone, should I be doing it? I think that takes a lot of like conscious effort to get to that point. Would you agree? I'd say it's that. It's a self-awareness thing. So you got to put in the time and effort, like you said, to work on understanding who you really are and what you're really good at. Like you said before, your superpower, try and figure out what that even is for you. Be certain of that and then triple down like Gary Vee will say, right? Triple down on your strengths, outsource your weaknesses. That's something that I wasn't always very conscious of. And you'll hear a lot of guys say like, I'm such a perfectionist. I don't want to let go of that. And that's, and then the other piece, that's ego. That's ego at work there. That's somebody who will say like, well, you know, nobody can do it as good as me. Well, that's obviously bullshit. And there are plenty of people out there that can do things a lot better than, than any of us. And you find those folks, you bring them on board, empower them to go on and do that, and then go do what you really can do better than most anyone else. And for me, understanding that difference, which took a lot of time, has served me really well in the sense that like now I'm always very critical of what I can and can't do, very aware, and then always and ever looking to fire myself. Like Just keep that uh, mindset every day and just always kind of be analytical in that sense. And I forget who even says that. that that's definitely not a gay-ism. <laughs> I wake up looking to fire myself every day. Um, but it's true. But it is very much true. Well, as the leader of your own business, Gabe, you've got to constantly invest in yourself and work on your own mindset and work on your own personal development, which I know you do a ton of. So give us an insight to Gabe's mindset. What goes through your mind every day? What are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? What drives you? Those, those kinds of things, you know, just that high level mindset stuff. So I'm a big Tony guy. So I go to Tony every year. I go to UPW. I've been to, and this is Tony Robbins. But I'm guessing most of the listeners will, will sure, know, yeah. right? And then Business Mastery was huge for us as well. I look to always and ever feed my desire to grow. That's uh, the basic human needs he'll talk about. So certainty, uncertainty, growth, contribution. So for me, it's growth. And so I know that if I'm not growing, I'm dying. And so my business as an extension of me is the same thing. So we wake up every day, the why the motivating factor is to grow. And as we grow for me as a leader is to continuously fence out for my team. So I need to keep providing them more opportunities for them to grow within my organization. Otherwise, they'll look to leave and they should. So if you're bringing on 
on A players, you better believe that you're going to need to level up just to continue to feed them. And so they're going to want to roll with A players. And that's just it. We've brought B players into the room and my team has quickly weeded them out. They smoke screened me and they got through and my team quickly said, hey, something's not right. Like I shouldn't be picking up slack for him or her like week after week after week. There's a miss here. And then that person either steps up or steps out. That's what motivates me every day. Those are my whys. I'm looking to ever and always grow personally, professionally, and in turn grow my business. So that way the team that we have here, the culture is such that we want to always be growing, growing quickly and serving. Those are kind of our like culture pieces. That's what gets me going. That's what gets me fired up. Yeah. So that kind of that culture and that mindset starts with you as the leader of your company and then trickles down and you create a culture throughout your organization of eight players and high expectations and everybody's growing with you and trying to do their best day in and day out. And that's kind of the culture you've created. So really cool. Cool. I don't think it's very easy to overstate. I mean, it sounds all like fine and dandy, right? But it's really hard to do that. It's hard work because it takes uh, discipline. And I'll be the first to admit that I am not as strongly disciplined as I should be. There are times where I don't necessarily want to be on our team huddle calls. There are times where I don't want to do our 30, 60, 90 day reviews with our new team members. But it really is about speaking it into existence, believing it, being very certain about what it is that motivates and inspires you and what the core values are of your organization. And then just by virtue of having that dialogue over and over and over to the point where you're like, they must be tired of hearing it and almost where you're tired of saying it, but you're not because you know it's more important than that. So here, I'm confident that anyone on my team at any given time without me in the room will treat a client the right way, will answer a phone call properly, will send an email the right Like We have built the culture as such that I have no doubt that the team will speak in our voice, our collective voice. Like you said, that takes time and effort. And the word my mentor always uses is discipline. And it always reminds me like, shit, I got to do a better job. I need to be more disciplined. (laughs) Yeah, sure. I know you wake up every day and you don't just spend 24 hours of the day working on your mindset and working on like these discipline things. You're out there actually running a business, doing things, taking care of problems, fighting fires. So how do you find time in your day to like set aside this mindset, this personal growth, yet still get the things you need accomplished? How do you find the balance there? Is there a balance? Uh, (laughs) There wasn't for a good, I would say two years. And each year, the month of December leading up to the year ahead, we do reflection and we kind of look on what we've accomplished in the previous 11 months. How did we do given what our goals were? And we take stock of that. And then we look forward for the new year. What's the overarching theme? And I really do pour into this process. Me personally, me for the business, me with each person on my team, what are they trying to accomplish personally and here? And so two years ago, our theme, maybe three years ago now was balance because there hadn't been any and I was just I was working myself crazy was taking no time to um, appreciate the fruits of our labors, we would close and go right to work. Now we make a conscious effort to celebrate every closing regardless of how large or small things like that. So I found balance in that regard. But I'll I'll be honest, and at the beginning, there was none, there absolutely was none. And I had to make a conscious effort to work at it. And over the course of a year, we did that. And some of it is stuck. But every once in a while, I still find myself reverting back. And I just got to kind of course correct and just remember, hey, like, you're doing this for a reason. So be present and uh, be thankful. Don't forget what you've done to get where you are. And and we do that. And we do try and celebrate and do team offsites and a lot of things where we just turn it off, just turn it off for a little while, refresh, recharge, and uh, then crack, get back at it. Yeah, you've kind of heard this saying, do less so you can do more, right? So if you're going to pull back, work on your team and your culture and your team's mindset and all those things with like this personal development type sphere, you're doing less in the business, that less out there finding deals, making offers, doing deals. Would you say that's allowed you to do more by doing less? You know, is that like a pretty accurate paradigm, if you will? 1000%. And that was taught to me. It was said, uh, slow down to speed up. I had a banker say that to me. And I said, well, how do I get to the, and we're sitting down and we're about to do a closing. And I was like, I'd like to be one of your preferred borrower partners. I'd like to be these guys that are doing these bigger developments in town. He said, well, on paper, you obviously look terrible because you're jumping from closing to closing. It's deal after deal after deal. And so your P&L looks great. Your income is there, but your balance sheet looks terrible. Your assets look terrible. So we can't lend to you on that bigger stuff. So you have to almost slow down, bank some reserves, and then speed up. And then you'll take that jump. And so I thought about that, went back and thought on it for a while. And I was like, I get where he's coming from. It's not in my nature to do that. So I really had to work consciously at it. And so what I find is that 
in that regard, with regards to even mindset development, like going away and saying, hey, I need you guys to block the noise for two days. I'm going to do a two-day offsite. I won't do anything business-related. I won't work in the business at all for those two days. I'll work on it at a different level, but then I'll show back up the following day on fire with a ton of implementable strategies, tactics, things that we can put into practice right out of the gate. And so, of course, that's slow down to speed up. That's uh, right. So same concept. Yes. Yeah. Is it. Another one of these paradigms you hear pretty often is like work on your business, not work in your business, right? So where is that line for you? You know, if you're out making offers and doing deals, and stuff to you is that working in your business are you being like a cog in the wheel or are you working on your business where do you find yourself there that talks to balance again and, and it's about balance and self-awareness and kind of understanding when it's time to fire yourself so right now with acquisitions i've been very much entrenched in that part of the process we've been rolling out just a massive marketing campaign i know that's relative but by our standards something really really big here locally and it's been a little over a month. And so I've been in there, like digging in, looking at the data. How are the callers doing? What, what kind of conversions are we getting? What are our contact rates? All that stuff. But I, I now know that once I get this a little bit tighter, it's time for me to stop working in the business, start working on it, put the right person in that seat so they can manage acquisitions. In fact, I was just messaging with someone earlier who was looking for an acquisitions opportunity. I'm like, all right, we're ready for that. So he may be that guy for that seat. We don't know yet, but I know for sure that I'm not the right guy for that seat. So yeah. I'm looking to get out. And the first thing I'll do once we put him in that seat and he's handling acquisitions and I've provided him with the training and tools and resources he needs to be successful there is I'll go figure out how to get him better quality leads, more of them. What else does he need? I'll figure out how to better support him in that role. And so that's what I think when I think working on as opposed to working in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like that. I like that distinguishment. So I've thrown a couple of phrases at you here and just kind of got your take. So let's keep doing that with one more. You hear this phrase, be slow to hire and quick to fire. So what's your take on that? How are you building your team? Are you going out and looking specifically for specific roles to fit into your business? Are you looking for more like people who are exhibit a specific type of quality or characteristic and saying, hey, I can bring them in, show them exactly what I need them to do. What's your take on, you know, when you're building your teams and doing that kind of stuff? The way I think about it is, uh, is culture fit first. Find someone who's aligned, like a values and culture fit, and then uh, teach them what they need to know to do what we need them to do here. Give them, like I said before, the tools and the resources to be successful, that education, that training. I'm okay with providing that if I know that they're an A player and that they'll be receptive to it and they'll do something with it. So we've got an onboarding process that most people would look at and just shake their head at and just say like, how do you even have the time to do all that? It's like, I'll, and then I'd go back at them and say, how do you not have the time to do this? Because a bad hire six months in could have cost you six figures. So I think you can carve out the 10 or so hours it takes on the front end to screen them and, and make sure they're the right fit as best you can. You, you'll never you'll never be 100% with this. We're still talking about people at the end of the day and life events and things like that. But if you can align the, cult, the, the values, find out that they're a culture fit early, bring them into the fold and give them the training and, and uh, the education that they need, I think you're in a way better spot to avoid having a fire later. But again, like we said, it's inevitable. And the only reason I have any EQ around it, because of course, as a process guy, I've got the processes. They're not mine. I may have tweaked them a little bit, but I went and found those elsewhere. I found who does it better than anybody else in our space, modeled it, tweaked it, and that's what we use here. But the other thing is the EQ piece and just like asking them some questions, taking them out for a beer, spending a day with them in the field and just seeing what they're really all about and ask them some heavy questions, ask them some why questions. And then you should be screening out the ones that shouldn't have been a fit in the first place. Uh, we're small enough that that should be the case. No, I like that. That's good stuff. It's really good to see your insight around those things. Luckily for you, I've ran out of phrases to fire at you. So <laughs> let's kind of switch gears for a second and just talk about your business, what you're doing exactly. I know that you do some really unique house flips. So tell us about that. I don't know that what you do is common throughout the country. It's definitely not where I'm at. So tell us a little bit about your business, what you guys specialize in. Yeah, just walk us through that. So our niche is very construction heavy style fix and flips. And so people call them pop tops or add a levels. And uh, what we do is we look for very dated capes and ranches and bungalows, anything that would serve as a good canvas for a second story. And we'll take the roof literally off the house and we'll put a second floor on. So it's essentially a box on top of a box. What we do in doing that is we double the square footage and in turn force appreciation. So we're creating a completely different product. So it's not buying a uh, three bed, two bath cape, renovating it and selling the same three bed, two bath cape just updated. We can make some serious spreads here in our market and 
in some other markets around the country where I know that there's some folks doing it, the spreads are better because the product you're ultimately turning out is not anything like what you started with. Those capes and ranches, they don't exist. By the time you're done, you've got a center hall colonial that's uh, more than twice as big because you'd be going up over the garage if there's an attached garage. In some cases, if it warrants it, depending on the market, we'll do a little addition out to the back or to the side and go up over that. That's less common. We like to try and stick to going up over the original house and the garage if it's got one. And um, so as you can imagine, if you're picturing a cape with a little garage alongside it, by the time we're done and you're looking at a house, it's literally twice the house. It's more than twice the house. So it's very construction heavy. It's labor heavy. It's capital intensive. And I'll be honest and, and say that, which is why there are barriers to entry, which is why we liked it in the first place. But like everything else, we quickly developed a system around it, identified the things that we were doing that other guys were doing right and wrong first, and then started implementing and tweaking, tweaking, quickly pivoted when we needed to. And we've got it down to, we do an ad level in four months, start to finish. That's um, super fast. Uh, we've done them. It's taken as long as a year, to be honest. And there's times where things at the town don't work out the way they should. The weather's not with us. A whole host of things that could go wrong. But when we're jamming, we could do them four months, six months prior more realistic, but the spreads are great. And that's our core competency. That's our niche here. Yeah, that's awesome. I like how you've gotten really specific. I think you've got to do that, especially when you're out like trying to find deals, right? Like you've got this very specific product that you're going to try to make. So you've got to see what can be put into that kind of box it really makes you focus on your acquisitions. And really, just like you said, you've got this niche, this very specific thing you're really good at. And I think you've done a good job at analyzing that there. Now, when you first got started in this, did you start with this at a level or is this something you worked your way up? I mean, this is pretty advanced house flipping stuff. This isn't like 101 paint and carpet be done with it stuff. The first handful of deals were not. They were cosmetic rehabs, but they were bigger cosmetic rehabs because I didn't necessarily know what I was doing. And so I would turn my back for a half day and the guy would demo the wall between the dining room and the kitchen. Now I suddenly show up and that wall wasn't supposed to go away or maybe oh, no. it was. I didn't know the difference. So I'm like, okay, well, that wall's gone. Um, now how are we going to reroute all that electric? What are we going to do with that, with the ductwork? So by virtue of making a lot of mistakes at first, I was being forced to do heavier construction than I had intended. We bought a house with a uh, three season room that was rotting and falling off the house, but we could have just taken it off the house or we could have shored it up, done it right and closed it and created a livable square footage. So we went with the ladder. So I learned a lot on that. And little by little, and then I think the one, like I was saying, and, and I think in our um, show flow, we're, we're going to lead into it, like our best deal, right? Well, our best deal was that big one I was talking about earlier, where we blew out the back of the house. We went back, we went up over the garage, over the original house, over the addition. The market was such in that particular area on that street, there was a bunch of new constructions that were commanding 1.3 and they were four plus thousand square foot homes. Well, this house had the footprint for that if we went back and up. And so we hadn't done anything like that before. And we said, all right, well, we understand all the different nuances of the construction piece. We just haven't done them all on one house yet. Let's go for it. That's where we really pushed the envelope. And that's what shifted us. And, and that's when we really started calling ourselves builders instead of flippers. We're builders in that regard. And that was a whole big branding and positioning thing that we, we could talk about as well. But that's where it shifted for us. And that's since then, there's no project I don't think we could wrap our head and hands around given what we've done and just our willingness to learn too. Like we'll figure it out. I think I see a lot of people trying try to enter the house flipping space, but then they've got these criteria like, oh, I don't want to deal with foundation issues or no HVAC issues or no roof issues. You're essentially saying like, bring them on. We're going to like take a mm -hmm. really in-depth, we don't want just the cosmetic carpet, lipstick kind of stuff. You're like, give us the heavy stuff. That's where you really specialize. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, uh, you know, kind of talking about, you alluded to how you've essentially built this home building kind of part of your business. Talk about how you've transitioned into that and what you're doing there. What we found is that as we were doing these construction heavy style renovations, these fix and flips, these add levels, we needed to differentiate ourselves from anyone else that was flipping homes. Nobody wants to buy what looks like a, essentially a new construction home from 123 Main Street LLC and never meet the guy behind the construction. So what we quickly realized is that we needed to start branding and positioning ourselves as builders. People trust the builder. And especially once we ticked over the one the million dollar mark here, people aren't buying million dollar homes from flippers, not in this market anyway. So we needed to say, hey, listen, don't worry, your home was built by a master builder who hires true craftsmen 
and uses the best quality materials. And that became a branding and positioning kind of thing. The logo had to be such, the signage was such, the agent representing us on the sell side. And to her credit, this was her idea back then. And she positioned us that way and just said, hey, if you're going to compete with those $1.3 million new construction homes down the street, like those were built by a builder. Those weren't flips. He took down a house, he subdivided three lots, and he put up three homes. Are you selling a house? Are you selling a home? Or are you flipping houses? And so that's where that distinction was made. I said, okay, well, on anything else that we do, we are going to own it. We had to own that. And so we started to, and we started providing home construction warranties and doing things the right way and putting our name on every house too. So now when you buy one of our projects, you're buying at the Silva Homes home. You're not buying a flipped house. And so that distinction was huge for us. And then that's still how we do everything. Our wholesale division is something completely different. But when we build homes, we genuinely build homes. And that's what you're talking about when you mentioned earlier in the show, you've created a vertically integrated company, right? So from all of this, your house flipping stuff to now having to sell the homes and a wholesaling organization. And then your, what was it? Your, what'd you call it? Like your supply company? What was that exactly? Yeah. So we, we have Silva Supply Company. By okay. virtue of the size and scale of the construction projects that we were doing and me taking some trips out to the National Association of Home Builders show in Florida and things like that, just to see what other guys were doing in the building space. I was just being exposed to all these products. And I was like, we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on a project and we're buying trim and siding and roofing and masonry block and mechanical equipment. And I said, like, we're spending far too much money to not understand better how that stuff is even is manufactured and ultimately ultimately sold through to the distributors and eventually to us as the retail buyer. So I started doing some digging and realized that the margins are absurd and said, like, we need a piece of this business if for no other reason than just to supply ourselves and our projects. So the supply company was born. We started in-housing materials, cabinetry at first, then some bath fixtures, then some millwork and so on and so forth. And there's still some things that at this size, we aren't allowed to carry the manufacturing and the building supply space is such that manufacturers do not want to deal with anyone that isn't a certain size. So if you don't have a 400,000 square foot warehouse, for example, you're not going to be able to talk to Anderson or Pella Windows or Thermatrue Doors. And even them, once they do find someone with enough space to inventory multiple trailers of materials, that guy will then sell to someone else. They call them one-steppers and two-steppers. And then eventually that gets sold to a supply house who's still bigger than me, who's still bigger than us, obviously. That would be like for the listeners in their markets, that might be something like Cukin Brothers or 84 Lumber. I'm trying to think of other bigger national players, but regional players, and then eventually guys like us. So what we do is we sell through our supply company arm to our LLCs who are doing these individual projects. Silva Homes is the one in the field actually putting the materials to work. The LLCs that own the projects are the one paying for them, of course. And to hit some of those quotas that we were obligated to hit to own to, like 50 grand a year in cabinets, for example. Well, we're not that busy. So we found that we could sell cabinets in-house to other investors, developers, designers, people in our sphere who were struggling with the same stuff. And we're not doing that. It's really more of a pass through with the small margin to account for the administration and the logistics and things like that, because it's not really a revenue stream for us. It's not a profit center, I should say. Sure. If we wanted it to be one, we'd need a lot more square footage and we would need to uh, hire then we would need to build that out. And so right now, that's not highest and best use. It's not the shortest path to the dollar for us. So that's not where we're going to put our resources. We're going to put those into acquisitions and building out our wholesale division. Man, talk about systems and processes. You've got a down game. It's cool to see how you've just built like this whole ecosystem around essentially just flipping houses, right? Like that's what it started out as just flipping one house and the next. And here all of a sudden you've got this, I'm going to call it giant ecosystem, although it's you know <laughs> maybe just relative, right? But uh, awesome stuff. Well, I've kind of gotten away from this. I don't always ask everyone one of our guests, their best and worst deals. But with you, I'm sure you've got some great and also war stories. So walk us through one of your best and worst deals. Sure. So the best deal was, was the one we talked about earlier with those competing new construction homes up the street. We bought what was a really big Cape with a two car garage from a wholesaler who had his intention was to renovate it and to sell it as the same size Cape, just clean it up. And so there was a spread there, but it wasn't a very good one, especially with what he was trying to sell to us at. So what we did was looked at those and said, those new construction homes, those 4,000 square footers, those are our comps. So we're not going to make this 1,200 square foot or whatever it was at the time Cape. We're going to take that and we're going to turn it into one of those. And so our best deal ever for, it wasn't our most profitable deal, to be honest. We did really well there, but we've gone on to make more on different projects. 
but because of the timing and what that did for us as a business, as a brand, understanding that if you're going to go all out here, you got to own it. And if you're going to be a builder, be a builder. And so we said, all right, let's build this thing. Let's, let's blow this house out. And so we did. And that is what I would say made it the best deal ever for us. The worst deal ever <laughs> it was another really big construction heavy at a level. It's actually in the town I live in now. It was the first project I did in that town. So I didn't take into account a lot of issues that we wound up having with the zoning official in town. They are just super sticklers there. And I thought they would have been easy to work with. I'd been kind of lulled to sleep with the towns I'd been in, been active in until that point. So we took on this big monster deal. It was coming on the heels of that one. And uh, I said, all right, let's do the same thing here. Well, we quickly found out that it's not as easy in some towns to do that sort of stuff. I also, being a finance guy, it's like, I hate to even admit it, but I structured the deal incorrectly. So with all these finance degrees, you'd think I'd have, and, and I really do have a good handle on leverage and I'm very comfortable with complex financial structures, but I was so ambitious, so excited to get into that deal that I structured it completely wrong. So we had some equity partners who were also lenders. So my equity in the deal got eaten up real quick. Any delays that we had basically fell on me. And so I wound up flat on that deal. In fact, I lost on that deal. It's the only deal I've ever lost on. And I know that it had a lot to do with the structure of the deal. Of course, the timeline was, was terrible. We were there far longer than we needed to be. And one other issue there that we hadn't faced in the past on something over, it was this was a million plus dollar home. When you buy on double yellows on busy roads here in New Jersey, it's about a $50,000 detriment to value on a 750 or so house. And we were pretty confident in that number. We'd seen that proof itself out. What we had never done is done a million dollar house on a double yellow and watched the market spank us for not taking into account that people, the exact same home sold behind us on a cul-de-sac for $200,000 more. So it's really more of a six-figure detriment to value when you build a house that size on a double yellow. And this was not a sleepy double yellow either. This was a busy road, so we should have known better. So we had a whole host of things go against us there. And those were all very valuable lessons. We no longer buy on double yellows. We don't borrow from partners. Like that whole structure is not, that does not work. And we make sure we understand by, we visit the towns now. And I had until that point, and for whatever reason on that one in particular, just didn't ask the right questions when I did go to town. But now if we're going into a new town, we're either finding and aligning with someone on a JV in a JV capacity who knows the town or we're going to town and me or my project manager now is in the field. He's heading to the town. He's talking to the zoning official and he's getting at least a verbal commitment from them that we can do what we intend to do there. So we don't wind up um, shooting ourselves in the foot. So anyway, those are our best and worst to date. Yeah, sure. Well, some strong learning moments there that you're going to carry forward and learn from and really take some value with you going forward. Yeah, I didn't kill you, it sounds so. Awesome. Well, Gabe, hey, as we're wrapping up here, we like to end every episode with a lightning round, just a series of questions we fire at you. You up for it? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. The first question in the lightning round is, what was your biggest hurdle getting started investing in real estate? And then what'd you do to overcome that? So uh, lack of capital, which is most likely everybody's hurdle, right? At the beginning, it's either you don't have deals or you don't have dollars. Well, I didn't have any dollars. After selling my business, I wound up pretty much flat. So I started at zero. What I was able to do is leverage. I happened to have a really good appetite for risk. I understand complex financial structures just by virtue of my background in finance, but I went and found really good lending partners who were willing to take a shot on a guy who was willing to commit to a process and just position myself as somebody who wasn't going to be a one and doneer. They said, all right, let's build a relationship here. This won't be transactional. They still hammered me like it was a transaction. Like <laughs> Oh, of course. Three points and 13%. I think I got on my first deal. Solid. <laughs> yeah. So our terms are significantly better than that now. But back then, I got what I got. And, and that's how we got going. And so a lot of people are like, well, can I use leverage? I, I don't think I can. Hard money is too expensive. Well, I think hard money is too expensive not to use. If it's a difference between doing a deal and not doing a deal, pay up, do the deal if the numbers work. So long-winded way. <laughs> so much for lightning round, right? <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> so leverage. Well, do you have a personal habit that contributes to your success? Yeah, my one non-negotiable is something I call Sunday sessions. And so I'm very, very unapologetically overprotective of my Sundays, church in the morning, carve out some time for brunch, see my family, spend time together, and then go off the grid and put my head down and set my intention for the upcoming week, review my calendar, lay out my appointments. And I like to send my messages. Most people don't respond to them on Sunday, which is a great reason to send them Sunday because they're in their inbox on Monday morning. I don't even consider it work, to be honest. It's all about mindset and setting the intention and the theme for the upcoming week, taking stock of what happened the week before, Sunday sessions. It's an absolute non-negotiable for me, and it's a really powerful habit. Like the calm before the storm. Yeah, get ready. Okay, cool. Well, uh, 
Do you have an online resource that you find valuable in your day to day, like something you podcasts? Use? I mean, okay. that's it. It's by virtue of listening to other people's experiences in like another Tonyism, right? He, he talks about turning decades into days. Well, if I can consume a decade's worth of someone's education over the course of reading an autobiography in uh, eight to 10 hours on audio or listening to podcasts, interviewing successful entrepreneurs and understanding where they went wrong. Like, I hope that your listeners got value from hearing my worst deal story and know like, holy shit, that project's on a double yellow. Like, let's do some math. Let's see what that could be. Exactly, right? Yeah. So podcasts for me are my absolute go-to. I probably am listening to anywhere between four and eight different podcasts at any given time. And I've kind of strayed away from books, which I know I need to course correct and kind of go back and start listening to some of those audios again, or physically reading books is always important. But right now, like I'm consuming podcasts. Awesome. Yeah, great. Well, what book would you recommend to the listeners and why talking about books? Depending on where they find themselves in their journey, I think uh, Think and Grow Rich, uh, actually Think and Grow Rich, right? So yeah, this is the book I give out more than any other book. I, I've probably given out about 100 copies of that book to people that I meet that are early on in their journey, trying to understand like what's even possible. Can I give more than one? Yeah, please. Out on this yeah. stuff. <laughs> Yeah, so Think and Grow Rich, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, The E-Myth, those are all really strong mindset books to get you going and understanding the difference between an owner and an operator and how to do business the right way and how not to just simply buy yourself a job, which is what most people are. They're not genuinely entrepreneurs, they're operators. And then like, if you're further along in your journey and, and if you've got a handle on that piece, things like Traction with Gino Wickman or um, Scaling Up. Vern Harnish, that, that's where I'm at right now. And those are books that that's like the tactical nuts and bolts stuff. Like that's us understanding how do you convey your vision, your culture, your values through to your team. So that way they are a mouthpiece for you in the marketplace and like heavier stuff like that. And that's the progression in business. Outside of that, I've got a whole other like a list, but no, those that's, are that's the ones. Great. Yeah, I, I love it. So we'll link all those books in the show notes for our audience members to pick up if they want. Traction's one that's been on my list that I haven't yet. So I think mm -hmm. I'm going to audible that one. So yeah. Awesome. Last question in the lightning round, Gabe, if you were to give advice to your 20 year old self to get started investing in real estate, what would you go back and tell yourself? Well, my 20 year old self was too busy partying to uh, <laughs> take anything seriously. So if it's me personally, I'm going back and telling that kid to stop playing games and get serious about life because that went on for far, far too long. But just I'm approaching 40, right? So I'm, I'm having a lot of that like midlife review kind of stuff in 20 years, like that 20 year increment, everything. It's my 20 year high school reunion next month. All this yeah, stuff's coming back uh -huh. around. It's just the one overarching message is take action, like take massive action. If you're sitting there wondering like, can I, should I, could I? Like you absolutely can. And uh, if you're in a circle that doesn't elevate you and doesn't support you in that, find a new circle. Go fire some friends and make some new ones. Align yourself. You are the average of the five people you spend time with. So take some action. Find some other people that are action takers and level up together. That'd be my advice to my old 20-year-old self because that kid was a punk. <laughs> Man, I love that. Awesome. Gabe, hey, it's been a lot of fun talking with you. I think you've got a real unique perspective on how you've built your business, just kind of how you approach things. And if audience members haven't yet, go check you out online. You've got a bunch of stuff on Bigger Pockets, YouTube, all that stuff. But where is the best place for people to check you out at? Learn more about you. I'm probably most active right now, I'd say on Instagram. We're turning our docu-series, The Build, back on on YouTube. So mm -hmm. we'll be bringing that back and that'd be a great place for people to go. And we kind of look at our content creation strategy as we're trying to empower, exhibit, and educate. So if I can empower you with some motivation and inspire, that I'm looking to do that. If I can exhibit and show you things that we're doing right and wrong, we're, we're really good about documenting things we do wrong. We've got something called the Flip Tip eBook. And if you search for it online and through my profiles, you can, you can link through it in my Instagram at Real Gabe De Silva, and you can download that. And it's the hundred mistakes I made the first three or so years flipping houses. Things from one hundred like, mistakes, huh? <laughs> the hundred mistakes, and I documented them. I took pictures of the things that I did wrong, so I'd remind myself not to do them again. I compiled them all into a book, downloadable ebook. It's free. Folks can go and download that. And um, from an educate standpoint, we're doing a lot of things here locally. We host an event, we host a bus tour where people come out and see our projects in varying stages of completion. And I talk them through how we do what we do. Uh, we've got a master class where we're getting ready to host and a mastermind that we we're launching next week for guys that are a little bit further along in their um, real estate investing journey. So uh, a long winded way of saying I'm online, <laughs> pretty much everywhere on social real Gabe De Silva is the best place to find me on Instagram. Yeah, I look forward to connecting with everybody. Uh, I still very much respond to every single message myself. So if anyone shoots me a message has any questions, feel free, I'll get to them all. Uh, sometimes it does take a little while, but I'm there. And, and it's me myself getting back to them. Awesome. One of the most 
prolific home flippers in the country, Gabe De Silva. Hey, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me on, brothers. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. All right, that wraps up this week's episode with our guest, Gabe De Silva. Wow, what an awesome conversation with Gabe. As you can see, Gabe shares so much insight and value around the way he thinks, the way he approaches things, and really how he's been able to build his business. So if you have any questions about any of the resources mentioned in today's show, you can find those in the show notes or at www.jacob.com airs.com till next week engineer the lifestyle you want you've been listening to the real estate way to wealth and freedom podcast providing you actionable content to build your real estate empire nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice please consult an appropriate tax legal real estate financial or business professional for personal advice the opinions of guests are their own information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have a potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom LLC exclusively.